I was really thrilled by your kind vin invitation to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and going back to a time when I met with David Muller when I was first associate dean, I've known about a lot of uh, cultural similarities between our medical schools, especially relating to issues around um, advocacy and uh, humanism in medicine. So I'm going to uh, talk about two components of our medical education program at Brown. One is the undergrad pre-med curriculum, which I think is relevant to you because you bring in students who've had a liberal arts background. Uh, and the second is a, a continuation of that uh, in the form of a scholarly concentrations program that we began in 2006. And this will be a mixture of some uh, anecdotal information, some history, and then I'll actually show you some data re relating to these two programs. Um, so when I say liberal medical education, what do I mean? Well, I, th this is a very loose definition. For me, what it's come to mean is that there's some emphasis on non-traditional pre-medical education, and that undoubtedly comes out of my personal experience. I went to Union College to be a pre-med student, but uh, quickly experienced what at the time was not yet known as pre-med syndrome and decided that those were not the people that I wanted to spend my undergraduate years with. I mean, I'm being very blunt, but you know, intense competition, uh, you know, it just wasn't what I wanted for myself as an undergraduate student, so I became a music major. Uh, and I think that that actually enhanced my, uh, my dossier as a medical school applicant. In fact, when I went to the University of Rochester interview, they set me up to have an interview with the, uh, with the chair of the composition department at the Eastman School of Music. Uh, which quickly led to my accepting their offer. I, I mean, I, I, I was just so thrilled. And in fact, during my time there, I interacted with a lot of people at the Eastman School. Uh, and when I talk about liberal medical education, obviously it needs to go beyond the undergraduate years. So I, I think an emphasis on disciplines that can continue into medical school is a goal. Obviously a challenging one given the intensity of, uh, and the demands of the curriculum in medical school, but a goal. Uh, you know, I mentioned pre-med syndrome. It's interesting that when, when I went back to look into it some more, there's not a lot of literature on it. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s when there was this survey-based study of colleges in South Carolina, uh, and it was recognized as being associated with excessive competitiveness, over-specialization, uh, and you know all of this in the face of the fact that uh, pre-med requirements had essentially not changed since the Flexner report. I mean, we're now about 100 years into expecting about the same things of our pre-med students as we expected back then, with the exception of the recent addition of uh, expectations for education in the behavioral and social sciences. Um, you know, Petersdorf wrote in 1989, quote, students become study machines characterized as hyper-competitive, narrow-minded, greedy, and dishonest. I mean, this has been around for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I'll only speak for myself, but I will say that plenty of my colleagues at Brown have recognized this among the pre-med students at Brown. And Brown is a place where students are afforded a great deal of uh, opportunity and flexibility in designing their pre-med uh, designing the pre-med curricula because Brown doesn't have um, majors. Brown has areas of concentration and students can customize those. And yet uh, a high proportion of pre-med students at Brown are advised by pre-med advisors to be science concentrators. So, you know, why study the humanities and fine arts? I mean, just in my reading over the years, this is something that I've put together, but to help us understand others through their languages, histories, cultures, and arts, to teach us to view evidence and facts in an open-minded way, and to consider more than one side of a question, to promote empathy, to foster social justice and equality, to enhance development of writing skills, uh, that's a tough one these days, to promote critical reading, to promote creativity, to encourage inquisitiveness. I think we all think of physicians as being inquisitive. We want them to be inquisitive, right? The last thing you want is to go into a doctor's office, describe what's going on with you, 
and realize that the doctor just puts you in a box and they're not really curious about finding out more. Uh, and um, my, my former boss, D, uh, former Dean Elia Dashi and I are actually working on a perspectives piece on inquisitiveness as a desirable characteristic among pre-med students. Um, and then lastly, to better implement advances in science and medicine, which actually has a lot to do with humanism and ethics. By the way, even though we're being recorded, if you have any questions or comments, stop me. I'll just, for the recording, I'll just reiterate them. So MedEd at Brown has a very strange history. Um, it started out in the 1960s with a master's in medical science program, and then after two years, the students would go off and they would, uh, th they would continue their education, their clinical education at other institutions. Uh, and Brown, which was a small liberal arts college, not really a research university in the more traditional sense, was very ambivalent about having a medical school program. So right up until the time when I became associate dean in 2005, for the vast majority of those years, the medical school had been called the program in medical education. Brown did not acknowledge that it had a medical school. Uh, a four-year school was established in the early 70s. First MDs were granted in the mid-70s. In 1980, the standard pre-med route for admission was abolished. And uh, I have it on personal information from the person who was dean at that time that it was abolished because there was a great deal of concern about the quality of students who were being recruited to Brown as a new school. And there were a lot of Brown undergraduate students who wanted to stay at Brown for their medical education. So that's where this idea of an eight-year continuum was launched. It was actually based on ad ad admissions goals, aspirations, and data. Uh, prior to 2000, my predecessor, Steve Smith, uh, implemented a competency-based curriculum referred to as the nine abilities that was actually widely viewed and truly was uh, very innovative at the time. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. And then after Ellie Adashi came and recruited me, uh, Ellie reintroduced the standard pre-med uh, route. So in 2016, we graduated 50 students from the eight-year continuum called the Program in Liberal Medical Education, or the PLME, uh, 56 standard pre-med students, 10 post -backs, and four um, students from Rhode Island through an early identification program. So close to 50-50 if you looked at the PLME versus pre-med students. So those nine abilities included some that I highlighted here in blue that I think uh, relate particularly to a background in the humanities and arts and social sciences, uh, effective communication, using basic science in the practice of medicine, really thinking about its, ap its ethical application, lifelong learning, professionalism, and moral reasoning and clinical ethics. So uh, I think that these nine abilities were designed by Steve and his colleague Dick Dallas with um, th this strong background in the humanities and social sciences among the PLME students in mind. So the PLME is pretty unusual. Uh, students have to demonstrate competency in a variety of areas, but there are very few course requirements. There are course requirements in biology, three of which must be taken at Brown, uh, and they can't be summer courses. But that requirement was actually implemented by Elia Dashi in 2005. Up until 2005, students could take bio courses wherever. Even at present, they can place out of uh, some bio courses based on advanced standing in high school. They were required to take inorganic and organic chemistry courses or their equivalent, so some students would be able to place out of those or they would take them elsewhere. Um, they could place out of the one requirement for a math course. They could place out of the uh, two semesters of required physics, and they were recommended to take courses in the behavioral sciences, social sciences, humanities, and also statistics. Um, and I'll show you some data on uh, outcomes related to a uh, number of science courses taken. The other thing about the PLEMI is that there's no GPA requirement because Brown doesn't calculate GPAs. Students can take a great many of their courses pass-fail. Uh, and we have had incoming PLME students who had a GPA of 4.0 based on having taken one course during their entire time at Brown 
for a grade, and they got an A in it. Do you require SATs? No. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, SATs, yes. Yes. And uh, when I show you some data comparing the PLME students with um, traditional pre-med applicants, it's a bit of an apples and oranges comparison because this is a highly desirable program and the qualifications of the students who come in are frankly ridiculous. I mean, 50 percent of them were either valedictorians or salutarians in their high school, at their high school graduation and they have higher SAT scores than other students coming to Brown. Um, so yes, SATs are required. Uh, in the required biology courses, there's a more recent requirement that they achieve an A or a B. Um, all other courses can be taken pass-fail. They have to make satisfactory progress uh, based on the college's requirements, same as any other Brown undergraduate student. They are not interviewed. Once they're in the PLME, they have um, a qualified admission to the medical school, so they're not interviewed prior to coming to the medical school. Their last interview was their interview for the undergraduate college, and they're not required to take the uh, MCAT. Some of them do because they become interested in applying out to other medical schools, but to come to the medical school, they're not required to take the MCAT. Uh, Paul George, who's our director of uh, second year curriculum, um, actually did, did a, uh, a master's in education program. And one of his advisors, uh, Yoon Soo Park, and Julie Ip, who's run the PLME for more than 20 years, and myself and Elia Dashi published a comparison a couple of years ago of the standard admission student and the PLME students. Um, number of courses in biology, chemistry, physics, and math. Uh, some clear-cut differences. These differences, the, the end's large, so these differences were actually all significant. Uh, if you look at science concentrators or majors versus non-science, big difference between the PLEMI and the uh, standard admission route. So I'm going to stop here to, to tell you a little bit of history about the PLEMI that um, since this is being recorded, I'm letting the cat out of the bag. Every dean who's come to Brown going back 20 years uh, beyond the, the dean who established the program has wanted to end the program. And they've wanted to end the program for two re uh, well, the primary reason is that they didn't believe that it was rigorous enough to bring highly qualified students to the medical school because there was no composition, there was no comp competition for those slots beyond competition for the undergraduate slots. Uh, there was also perceived lack of rigor because of the things that I just told you about. So two things have prevented each subsequent dean, including our current dean, Jack Elias, from abolishing the program. One is that the overwhelming majority of our more senior alumni came through the PLME. So development would just keel over and drop dead if we abolished the PLME. Uh, and as soon as this is brought up, everybody acknowledges that. But the second thing is that the PLME is, has been uh, extraordinarily successful in bringing students from traditionally underrepresented groups, including a great many students from disadvantaged backgrounds, to the med school. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that if, you know, that you've all talked to your admissions officers here and you, you know that uh, achieving the desired level and quality of diversity in a medical school is really challenging. Well, for Brown, the PLME solved that a long time ago, at least in the sense that we were, uh, we were graduating med school classes that looked quite a bit like the populations that they were going to be taken care of, thanks to the PLME. So um, that's really why I put this in here. Two very compelling reasons to consider the program, totally separate from what I always thought was a compelling reason, which is that it's an outstanding program that produces uh, physicians who are grounded in areas that are not typical for pre-med students. So here are some exam performance scores. And what you'll see here, you know, the, the, our, our year one, two exams in our courses are timed single best answer multiple choice exams taken on an iPad or a laptop, uh, you know, really standard. And in, in implementing that 10 years ago, uh, we satisfied a lot of students who were scared to death of step one. So that's how we give our first year one, two exams. So that you can think of those year two, one, two exams as standardized examinations. And then there are USMLE 
step scores and clerkship self-exam scores. And what you can see is that the standard pre-med students score a little better on all of those. Uh, why? I, you know, I, uh, less anxiety because they've done more test taking in the form of the MCAT. I, you know, whatever. Uh, there, there's a selection bias because they have high MCAT scores. We have no idea. But, you know, these data are fairly consistent. There are always significant differences. If you look at the range on these box and whisker plots, um, the range overlaps a lot, right? I mean, uh, so, um, you know, how, uh, if I were giving a phys physiology talk, I, I, I might say it's statistically significant, but it's not necessarily physiologically significant, right? I mean, there's so much overlap there that, uh, you know, if, if you were thinking about one program versus the other, it's kind of unlikely you would focus singularly on this. Um, competitive residency placement. So it was Paul's idea to define competitive residencies as though for, uh, for which the mean step one score of the people who place in those residencies is over 240. So the groups look the same upon graduation. This is a survey that Julie Ip did of about 250 PLME alums and they had been out for at least four or five years. They were mostly beyond residency. And if you look at the things that they viewed as very important, those include, uh, and I mean, the, the survey, this was not the most rigorous survey design. Uh, the survey is going to have some inherent bias because it focused on things that the PLME focused on. But they considered the integration of biological sciences, natural sciences, and social behavioral content to be important. And they get some of that in, in the PLME because of small group sessions. Um, have, you know, the relative importance placed on small group and problem-based learning, uh, quite a bit of importance placed on regular exams that will enhance their preparation for standardized exam taking, uh, very low um, level of importance placed on traditional inorganic and chemistry content and on traditional uh, physics and math and calculus content, but high importance placed on quantitative reasoning and statistics and then relatively high importance on humanities content. So the, the, the plemies and their outcomes look like the students that we think we're going after when we recruit them. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, circ there's a circular aspect to all of this. So in 2009, this report came out from Howard Hughes and AAMC. Um, you've all, you're mostly all familiar with this, I'm guessing, and, uh, hi, David. <laughs> and um, w we thought that this was a wonderful blueprint for changes in the PLME curriculum. So uh, Julie and I and uh, several other people worked on a proposal um, in which we would integrate year one and two coursework so that there was biology-oriented nat uh, natural sciences and quantitative reasoning, and that would replace the traditional pre-med requirement in chemistry, physics, and math. Um, ag again, an anecdote. The, uh, we, we convened a group of leaders in the key undergraduate departments and met uh, every other week for a semester at lunchtime and you know, informal meetings to hash this out. It was ultimately blocked by the chairs of the chemistry and physics departments. And I think there were two reasons. One is that uh, the, the chair of the physics, uh, the chair of the chem department happened to be the person who'd been running the orgo course for a long time, the, the first orgo course. And he, his, his mother had died in hospital uh, in relation to a medical error. And he told me that he sincerely believed that the kind of rigor introduced in pre-med curricula through courses like organic chemistry would reduce medical errors. And I tried to dissuade him of that and say, you know, it's really more about communication. And he just didn't buy it. The second thing, which I think was actually a more important uh, issue, was that the number of graduate teaching assistants assigned to those departments was proportionate to course enrollment. And if we created a PLME course that combined math, 
chemistry, and physics, their course enrollment numbers were going to go down. So it, so, so it never moved forward. The first year course never moved forward. We were able to, on our own, introduce a senior seminar, a year-long senior seminar that involves case-based discussions uh, that, that in turn, in turn uh, involve basic biology, population health, social medicine, uh, ethics, et cetera. And that's been running for about six or seven years now. It's an elective course for PLMEs. About two-thirds of them decide to take it. There's problem-based small group learning. There are standardized exams in the course, uh, single best answer, multiple choice exams, that is, with a you know, question bank that we've developed. Um, uh, so for example, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I used to give uh, a talk, a, a, a series of talks in small groups in that course on disorders of sex development and gender dysphoria, you know, something that pre-med students don't usually get a lot of exposure to. Uh, one of my endocrine colleagues would give a talk on um, uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, race, race as a social construct and how data on racial differences in, in type 2 diabetes uh, are accounted for. Um, so things like that were incorporated into the curriculum for this small group seminar. So that, that's kind of as far as we got. Now what about PLME student performance? And these are data that I actually put together at the time to convince the faculty in the sciences that the PLMEs were okay as a group, uh, irrespective of their undergraduate course experience. So on the x-axis for these slides are the number of pre-med science courses that they took. And you'll see that there are some students who are down in the neighborhood of two and a whole bunch who are you know, taking fewer than five. So these are correlations with average year one exam scores in the medical school, and there's a significant relationship, but I think you'll agree that it's not a meaningful relationship. Um, USMLE step one scores, average shelf exam scores once the students get to, uh, get to their required clinical rotations, USMLE step two CK scores. And finally, the discipline specific, that mean step one score that we use to look at uh, competitiveness of residencies that the students are getting into. So, uh, you know, if you just look across there, there's uh, really no, no meaningful relationship here. Now, again, these are only PLME students. Uh, we didn't do a parallel analysis um, for our standard pre-med students at the time. Um, but I, I, we, we interpreted all these data as indicating that the number of science courses, you know, at least in this context, you know, this pre-med undergraduate curriculum where students are pre-admitted to medical school, the number of science courses that they take has basically no bearing on their performance during medical school. Any questions or thoughts about any of this before I go on? Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm curious because some of the things that we talk about here is uh, obviously student performance, but also the, the level of support required to get students to a performance level that shows up on one of those scattered Yeah. So in, in your investigation or in, just in your experience, have you seen that different cohorts of, cohorts of students require different levels of support along the way in order to be able to perform that way on the shelf exam? Yeah, I, I, um, I have enough experience to, to draw a tentative conclusion. And what that experience says is that it's the students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds who are using the bulk of our advising resources to you know, achieve adequate academic performance. And that crosses uh, in a, com in a com com comparable way all the admission routes. Uh, so I, I don't think, I, I don't, you know, first of all, I wish that our advising and support services were so effective that we could take a student who was really at risk for being at the bottom and move them to the top. And I, you know, we don't see that. Uh, what we do see is that students who are at risk for not being able to pass step one benefit, you know, and, and, and that's based on data because they take practice exams and all. Uh, but no, I, PLME students are not using more, more resources of that type uh, than the other students. They're used to more advising because the nature of their advising, there is a PLME advising group that works with undergraduate students, 
and they are very different than the typical pre-professional advisors in most colleges. Uh, so they're used to a different type of advising, which is the advisor getting to know them, getting to know what's important to them, uh, you know, helping them achieve, uh, constantly being, you know, constantly redefine career goals. I mean, they're, they're an interesting group. There was another question, I think. Yeah. I was curious, um, you showed that the PLMA group had a higher diversity quotient. Yeah. Is there is it because of the way the undergrads are recruited differently than medical students, or what? Yeah, so why, why is the PLME group more diverse? Because, because we're, um, we're cherry-picking students before other medical schools get to them. Oh. I mean, you know, we're, we're admitting them to medical school out of high school. Yeah. And that's so attractive uh, that, you know, the student who, you know, could clearly get into an outstanding undergraduate school mm -hmm. will come to Brown. We know that that's what's going on. There was a little while where, where the, the attrition rate from the PLME with students applying out was pretty high. And to be honest, that kind of ended when we got the naming gift for Albert Medical School and all of a sudden we had resources and we built a new medical education building and, uh, and we became a real medical school at that point. Before that, our students were getting all their coursework uh, in you know, registrar space on the Brown campus. And there was no identifiable medical school. So the attrition rate in the PLME is very, very low now. So um, when I was recruited by Ellie to be associate dean, uh, I had been uh, teaching biochemistry uh, and cell biology for many years, and I had been directing the MD-PhD program. And Ellie recruited me because he thought a basic scientist would be best qualified um, to, to be medical education dean. Uh, he himself is a physician scientist. And, um, I'd like to believe that we all got sort of lucky because that really wasn't my focus. Uh, and I was much more focused on things that were sort of consonant with Brown's culture. And in particular, I mean, I had had many PLME students work in my laboratory over the years. And I was a real fan of that program. So for, when Ellie challenged me to, to do curriculum development that would be genuinely innovative, uh, I wasn't quite so focused on rearranging things, although we did that. We went from a course-based curriculum to a, a, a curriculum that was very integrated both horizontally and vertically, and we abolished the many of the traditional courses. I had the pleasure of abolishing my own biochemistry course. That was, <laughs> that was terrific, a real weight off my shoulders. Um, but, but when I really thought about innovating, my primary goal was to, was to allow PLME students who had not been science concentrators to flourish. And what I knew about them is that they were doing lots of stuff, but they were having to search out mentors and opportunities. So working with uh, a guy named Jeff Borkin, who's the chair of family medicine at Brown, and a number of other people, we, we developed the idea for a scholarly concentrations program. And here's the timeline for that. So during the first several months after Ellie appointed me as associate dean, I presented this to him and uh, to the Brown Corporation's medical school subcommittee, and it was greeted with um, it was greeted with some skepticism because it was pretty uh, a pretty unorthodox proposal, and it was going to require resources. But Ellie, um, to his credit said, go ahead, had the good fortune of recruiting a woman named Emily Green. Uh, Emily at the time was an advisor at Harvard Medical School. Um, and I had the good fortune of her falling in love with uh, somebody who lived in Providence, so she wanted to move. Uh, and she came in, into the job and just took it, took it on with great enthusiasm and skill. And she was the one who really got, got it going. So we offered, uh, we offered scholarly concentrations to members of MD-11 within months of this idea sort of coming about. Um, and the way we did that was, was Emily and I met with uh, the first year students and said, we've got this idea, are you interested? And about half the class said that they were. Um, I'd been at Brown my whole career and knew people outside of the, uh, outside of the biomed division, and I went and talked to people. I mean, I remember going to a guy who I had met named Hal Roth, and Hal was the uh, um, 
the, the director of a program in contemplative studies in the, in the religion department. And I said, Hal, what do you think about working with medical students? And he said, well, I can tell you one thing. They all need to meditate. <laughs> and we actually established a, a contemplative uh, program for medical students to reduce stress. But Hal founded a contemplative studies concentration. Uh, I went to uh, the guy who was the director for the Kogut Center of the Humanities, and he signed on. Um, I, I don't want this to sound like you know it was all, you know, it all evoked great enthusiasm. The the chair of economics had absolutely no interest in working with us, even though the students were very interested in being able to concentrate in areas relating to uh, econ. Um, but a bunch of people came on. There was an internist who had worked uh, as a journalist before she went to medical school, and she had served on the editorial staff for the New England Journal of Medicine. And Terry signed on for a concentration that she developed called Physician as Communicator. So the whole thing happened. Uh, Emily convened a group at AAMC back in 2007 that became a scholarly concentrations consortium of which uh, Sinai has been a member for many years. And there are now over 70 schools that have programs that are mostly called scholarly concentrations programs. And somebody may have been doing that before us, but I wasn't aware of the term ever being applied to uh, either an elective or required program of this type. Um, people at Yale have been doing, uh, you know, writing a required thesis for many years, and there have always been students who've done those, you know, their work outside of uh, traditional biomed investigation areas. But um, th this has grown and it's now become part of many, many medical school curricula. Um, more of them are required than elective. Um, I, I still uh, have the sense that if you require one of these programs, you lower the bar. Because when, when we had, I think the second meeting, we had an intense discussion, especially with the folks from Pitt, about this, these programs being required or elective. And I asked them what I thought was the critical question, which is, if somebody doesn't meet the requirements for the scholarly concentration, are you really going to prevent them from graduating? Because if it's required, that's the definition. They have to meet the requirements or they don't graduate. And the answer that I got was, you know, sort of shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, you know, everybody graduates if they pass their courses. Um, so even the ones that are required are probably not required in the true sense of the word. Uh, and a great many schools have now implemented these, except they are totally focused on uh, basic translational or clinical biomedical research. That, you know, the expectation is not that students are going to work in the humanities or social sciences or arts. Um, so here's the timeline for, the, for this program at Our Place. Students hear about it uh, long before orientation, and um, you know, to be blunt, it's been a great recruiting tool. Uh, it, it, it's a way of sort of defining the culture of the med school for students that would otherwise not be available, um, and it, it has really helped us recruit students with uh, very diverse backgrounds, very diverse academic backgrounds. Um, so early in the year, the, the student identifies um, a concentration and a mentor, and they do that based on interactions with students who are already in the programs and uh, sort of a, um, almost like a speed dating event where all the concentrations have a table and the students move from table to table. Uh, we have um, good funding for them to be able to do uh, summer work for 10 of the 11 weeks that they get between years one and two. We actually, uh, change the schedule in year two so that Wednesday is a self-study day for everybody, whether or not they are doing a concentration. So that, uh, the vast majority of Wednesdays have nothing on the schedule um, that's required, or uh, no lectures on the schedule even. Lectures are not required at our place, which I think is now the norm. Um, we encourage them to integrate the scholarly concentration work into clinical rotations and electives and weeks off, and then uh, each concentration runs an event prior to graduation. The students are given a certificate at graduation. Um, and there are, there are three formal progress reports that are made. Uh, 
as is the case in so many areas, the website's important. Uh, students begin exploring this website where they can go and look at previous scholarly concentration products um, that other students have, have done. Um, th they can look at qualifications of the faculty in each of these areas. Uh, the program components that we define for them on the website, rigorous independent scholarship, cross-disciplinary study, mentored relationships, the mentoring becomes just about the most important thing for the vast majority of students. Um, there are group seminars and courses that are run by each concentration. Uh, there's longitudinal work across all four years of medical school, and then they have to submit a scholarly product. Uh, the final product, however, is not really pigeonholed into one area or another. If students, you know, write a traditional paper and publish something, that's terrific, but that's not required by any means. Um, st students in the med ed concentration have uh, worked on uh, curriculum with course leaders. I mean, for example, uh, we were struggling with how to introduce epigenetics into the preclinical curriculum. So a student interested in that area who was doing a med ed concentration developed uh, a, a bunch of online modules. Um, they can organize an <laughs> academic symposium, and I'll, I'll show you an example of something like that in a minute, uh, an outreach program that can target either uh, healthcare professionals or patients. Um, if they undertake a legislative campaign, which a few students have done, uh, they, all they need to do is document that. They can produce an original piece of uh, art. They can develop a bioengineering to tool or an app. Uh, we've had students, one student in particular, um, who had a strong computer background, developed an app to help patients interpret laboratory data. Uh, and I don't think that it ever really caught on, but at the time I thought, well, you know, A, great idea, B, boy, will that let a, let a lot of physicians off the hook. Um, a new clinical protocol, especially relating to patient safety and quality. So very open-minded with regard to what the final product might be. Uh, they're evaluated based on classic criteria, so there is an evaluation process and then students either do or don't get their certificate based on that. And it winds up meaning a lot to them, especially if they've stuck with it, if they've not been part of the group that uh, accounts for attrition from the program. By the time they're fourth year students, they, they wanna, uh, you know, they wanna get there. So the first five graduating classes were the, uh, were the subject of um, uh, some data that we put together with Emily uh, over those five years, 35% of first-year students elected to enter the program, and that number has been really constant. Over those first five years, the percentage of graduates who elected the program who completed it, uh, sorry, the percentage of graduates who completed the program was 30%. So um, I'll show you some attrition data. So I, I added on to this, uh, for this talk, some additional data um, that Thais Mather, who currently directs the program, gave me. So over the uh, five years, we've had 30, 161 students uh, are in, in this analysis, and uh, 130 of the 161 completed it for an aggregate attrition rate across those classes of 19 percent, and the attrition rate has actually gone down and held steady at more like 10 percent. Um, I think this is partly because students have a better idea of what they're getting into than, than they did when we first started the program. Uh, they have their colleagues to draw on. Uh, most of the concentrations have been um, in existence for a while now and pretty stable, although I'll show you how things have changed. Uh, these are number of students and completion rates for the, uh, for the concentrations that started out. So you can see they're all over the board. So, for example, there was a lot of enthusiasm expressed by students for a dis disaster medicine um, concentration but students were going to have to, in all likelihood, go somewhere as part of that concentration, and the, and the concentration leaders did that all the time. They were emergency medicine docs who would you know, suddenly be going off to Haiti or whatever. So uh, it didn't quite catch on. Medical informatics in the beginning didn't catch on. Uh, med ed didn't, it stayed that way. Women's reproductive health has been an area of interest. You know, but, but the, 
there were numbers ranging from 60 to 100 percent for completion rate uh, and a lot of variation in the students electing to do the program. What happened to medical ethics? It didn't change much. Yeah, so actually, uh, if, if you look down here at where it says medical ethics and then below that medical humanities, in 2008, there was, those were two separate combina uh, concentrations, and the directors of those, uh, what happened is the guy directing medical ethics became a member of the Kogut Center for the Humanities. So they decided to combine them. Uh, and I'll show you some data on, um, you know, how interest in these concentrations has changed over the years. Uh, you know, advocacy and activism became caring for the underserved, and there were a bunch of students who they said, well, this isn't a really meaningful concentration to us because I want to do women's reproductive health, and what I'm interested in is advocacy. So, you know, what's the story there? And the directors of the women's reproductive health concentration wanted students doing advocacy, so it, it sort of didn't work out. And these, these have evolved in a very uh, organic way, and I, I, you know, what, what's there now makes sense for students. Um, contemplative studies transformed into something that the students wanted to call uh, integrative health and contemplative practice because they wanted it to be more healthcare related. So here are a few data on who's doing what and th the most extraordinary change here is what happened in medical informatics. Over the course of just a couple of years it became the most highly ascribed to concentration. Uh, and that's totally based, I think, on what students were hearing about the importance of data management in healthcare and all of the debate that took place around the Affordable Care Act and trying to focus more on outcomes. And all of a, student, all of a sudden, students realized, uh, plus an implementation of the electronic health record, which the students were hearing from their faculty, had resulted in a huge reduction in efficiency among the faculty. The faculty would all be complaining, oh, you know, I go home every night now and I do my electronic health record and then I do the next ones for the patients that I'm seeing tomorrow and it, you know, it's been a huge, and, and students would hear this and they think, you know, there must be a better way and they've gotten interested. Uh, a, a bunch of uh, areas have stayed pretty consistent, you know, among them, for example, medical education, which uh, that's almost a, a self-serving concentration in a way because the students reliably uh, produce improvements in our educational program. You know, and then you look at physician as communicator. Terry's had a number of students working with her every year. They focus on uh, a variety of things. Some of them wind up writing blogs. Um, so what about the differences between concentrators and non-concentrators? Well, to a large degree, there aren't any. Uh, age at matriculation, route of admission, proportion of undergraduate science major, majors, number of undergraduate science courses, none of those were different. There was a slight difference in female uh, versus male, but it, again, it was statistically significant but not really meaningful. Uh, and there were slightly fewer groups from, uh, fewer students from traditionally underrepresented groups. And we think that that may have had to do with the fact that from very early on, we talked to students about the time demands of being a concentrator. And if students are coming from a disadvantaged background, they may well be anticipating that they're going to have to um, put more time into the standard required coursework to be able to succeed and be able to excel. Um, so that may account for that. Uh, in terms of exam performance, no differences in exam average, USMLE scores, or, or competitiveness of the residencies that they choose. It's interesting that even students interested in the most highly competitive, res you know, so our places like many, I think, you know, the orthopedists tell students, if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, you have to decide that in the first year and then you have to do a whole bunch of research in orthopedics because the average orthopedic resident has 15 publications plus presentations, uh, you know, et, et cetera, to which I say, what a crazy way to choose a bunch of orthopedists who are never going to do research. But our students interested in ortho have done concentrations. Are there any orthopedists in the room? If any of you were listening afterwards, I apologize. <laughs> our concentrators had a slightly higher rate of achieving honors in the core clerkships, but when we looked at the uh, granular data, it was because they did better on the shelf exams. So I, 
you know, although there was no, diff no statistical difference in shelf exam performance, it looked like the students who were excelling in the shelf exams and were therefore more likely to get honors were uh, more represented among the concentrators. Um, and then there was a slight increase in the number of uh, published articles that they had, which shouldn't be too surprising since the program is designed to provide them with mentorship so they can ultimately produce something. Um, you know, what are the benefits to the student? First and foremost, I think development of a strong relationship with a faculty member, which the students appreciate and acknowledge. Um, but they also get to do presentations. They may get to publish. Uh, th their work can be described in their dean's letter. It become, the students tell us that this invariably becomes a, discussion, uh, a topic of discussion at their residency interviews. Uh, so the students value those potential benefits for, uh, for, residency, for the residency match. And then there's a sense of accomplishment that I think is genuine based on the fact that students uh, you know, really do want that certificate. What's the, what are the benefits to the school? We've engaged faculty that we would other, otherwise not engage. Uh, we've enhanced scholarship and academics. Uh, we've increased national visibility for the school, and I'll put up a slide uh, illustrating that. We've enhanced the residency match for students who have less traditional interests. Um, we've definitely enhanced student uh, recruitment, and the development officers love this program. It's been an opportunity for fundraising. Our students in the health policy concentration each year have developed uh, a series of talks called Healthcare in America. And this would not have happened if we didn't have a health policy concentration. So three years in a row now. And if you look at the people on this list, it's a distinguished list of speakers. Otherwise, these folks would not have come to Brown. So what does all of this mean? Well, like most medical schools, and I apologize if this is not the case at Sinai, or you can just let me know if it's not, we don't actually have the long-term outcome data that we would like. You know, wh what are the practice characteristics of our students 10 years after they graduate from medical school? We can track who's getting NIH grants and stuff, but in terms of patient care, almost no data. Um, we don't have data on teaching effectiveness uh, that allows comparisons with other schools. And uh, Ellie and I are actually talking to somebody in our education department at Brown about developing uh, and implementing instruments to evaluate relative teaching effectiveness across courses. Um, now that I'm no longer associate dean, I don't mind the idea of telling the gastroenterologists that their block isn't nearly as good as the endocrine block, which will be a likely outcome of this. You know, that kind of comparison, not that specific one. But, um, so we have access to recruitment data, student satisfaction data, and fundraising data, and that's all we've got. Uh, the, the PLME, based on any, uh, a, a, any point of view, has made a major contribution to the culture at our medical school. Um, and one of the uh, main ways in which it's done that is to uh, advance appreciation of the value of a liberal education certainly among students, but also among faculty. Um, and the PLEMI allowed us to establish the kind of scholarly concentrations program that we did establish. Um, and it helps place a great deal of emphasis on student initiative and independent study in medical school. Uh, so do these programs do the following? Do they, do they help our students advance themselves in the areas that I said were goals of a liberal education. We have no idea. I mean, the bottom line is that I just kind of did a horse and pony show, because this all sounds great, and we don't have any outcome data. For all I know, the students who you know, uh, got, took all their courses at Brown for A's and were neuroscience concentrators who took extra chemistry courses are the best performing physicians. You know, I have no idea because we don't collect the data. So that's it. And I'd be happy to take questions. Question. Yeah. So how long does it take for the students to get through the SC program? Is it, is it the same length of time that the students Yes. Are? Yes. It, it's, it's built into the curriculum. Um, so it's, it's designed to be done within the four years. Yep. And we allow them to take elective time for it. 
Uh, and then there are those self-study days during year two. Um, and we do a pretty good job of funding them over the summer. So, so. two follow-up questions to that. One is, do any students take an additional year? Many. Many do. Yep, yep. And they do a variety of things. And what do they give up? What are the types of educational experiences that the SC students give up that the traditional medical students have? And o only, uh, the only thing they're giving up is time. So they're spending less, yeah. Uh, well, free time and also study time, I think. Study. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our non-concentrators on Wednesdays, you know, self-study day on Wednesdays, they're likely to spend the time, uh, you know, focusing on their coursework. Yeah, so it, it's a pretty significant sacrifice. And the ones who really get into it, I just, uh, uh, I just bumped into a guy who did the Compl contemplative studies concentration um, I bumped into him. He's now a member of my department. He got recruited back, but it took me a while to, to bump into him. And I, and I said, so Jack, has it made a, you know, made a difference? And it turns out that during his adolescent medicine fellowship, he focused on things that related back to what he did when, when he was a concentrator. Uh, you know, in contemplative studies, I, you know, go figure. But adolescents have stress, so. Yeah, so, so th there are sacrifices that the students make, but the majority of them seem to get engaged, which I, I think is one of the major advantages of doing it as an elective program. And if you're a faculty member, you know, I've always said, the only students I want in my laboratory are the students who want to come to my laboratory to do research. Because the ones who are doing it just to have something on their, you know, in their dossier are more likely to set things on fire, cause accidents, et cetera. You know, so it's, it's the same principle. Thanks. My pleasure.